A few weeks ago, I got to do something I never thought I would be able to do. Swiss rail manufacturer Statler brought me out to see their North American train factory where they assemble trains for all kinds of different transit systems. Not only did I get to see how trains are actually assembled, but I also got to see some of the most modern transit vehicles on the continent, all the while learning about how you spin up a modern train factory on a continent not necessarily known for modern trains. So come along for this epic tour. The tour began with a trip of several thousand kilometers from Toronto to Salt Lake City, Utah. If you're wondering what's so special about Salt Lake, there's a couple of things. For one, it's a beautiful city that does remind me a lot of Switzerland with the snow-capped mountains and the clean streets, but it's also got a really educated workforce and one of the best train and bus systems for a small American city. Plus, you can go skiing, quite the bonus. As you can imagine, I'm going to be doing a few dedicated videos on the city and its transit system, as well as my visit to Stadler, so make sure to stay tuned for those. So what does Stadler actually do in Salt Lake? Well, they build trains, of course. Right now, there are three main projects going on at the plant, building bi-level suburban multiple unit trains for Caltrain from the San Francisco Bay Area, single level diesel regional trains for DART from Dallas, and subway cars for MARTA from Atlanta. That being said, Stadler has also done more projects in North America than you might realize, with trains provided to BART, Capital Metro in Austin, the Riverline in New Jersey, and even the luxurious Rocky Mountaineer Tour Train. If you're not familiar with the rail manufacturing space, Stadler isn't new. They've long been known for building a lot of deeply custom and bespoke trains, for systems like rack railways. But what is new is the way the company has really exploded onto the scene in recent years with far more trains being ordered from them all over the place, from New Zealand to Sweden and of course the United States. I've even run into some of their stuff overseas while filming. The designs are sharp and you can really tell it's a Stadler train or tram because they have a pretty consistent design language. So a train from Stadler in the US or Canada looks just like the ones from Europe. Arriving at the factory, it looks sort of deceptively diminutive from the outside and from online satellite maps, but it is actually huge on the inside. We walked over 10 kilometers around the facility during the day. What's nice is that since the factory is located near the Salt Lake Airport and an interstate, it's pretty easy to get stuff shipped in. And even better, there is a direct rail link to the facility for freight services from Union Pacific and BNSF, so trains can be delivered to locations across the continent. What's slightly less great is the transport access to the factory. It's not exactly Europe, so while there is a bus, most do drive. That being said, I did suggest an extension of the test track a few kilometers to the airport where people can connect to the light rail network. So if that happens, well, I take full credit. In all honesty though, Salt Lake City is expanding its rail network constantly, so given all of the industrial jobs in the general area around the plant, it might actually be something worth considering at some point. So how are the trains actually built? The process starts with car bodies, which arrive at the facility wrapped like Christmas gifts. These are then stored in the yard until they're ready to be turned into trains, and are then moved inside. Bodies used to come all painted, but they're doing more and more of the paintwork right at the plant, with the huge paint booths they've recently added. With the parts inside the building, things are kind of split into two different streams, building out the car bodies and building the bogies or trucks that the car bodies will rest on. Work on the body starts with measuring them with a laser rangefinder. This allows slight adjustments to be made as each car will have slightly different dimensions. From here, the insides are then marked up with the notes of where to drill and mount components. After that drilling is completed, things can start to be mounted within the body, including tie-down points, cable raceways, as well as hoses, and the cables themselves, as well as mounting points for various internal fittings. External work is also done. The front mask is mostly aesthetic, and those are actually manufactured locally in the US, painted in-house and then mounted on during the body build-out. This component is actually critical because it seriously impacts the safety of the vehicle. At the same time, at a bunch of different stations, various internal components are finished, including cutting the flooring, putting together the driver's desk, and assembling and testing various electrical panels and systems. It was really awesome walking around the factory because people were just willing to pause their work for a moment and show what they were doing, which was really cool. Now, some of this work is actually done upstairs as they basically have a small office building inside the factory. That's necessary because not only do people managing things like logistics and training need space, but there's also a surprising amount of in-house engineering. 
As it turns out, even two trains which look very similar are actually often surprisingly different beneath the surface, and so local engineers are needed to make modifications to base train designs, align specifications with customer requirements, and come up with solutions to problems, like for example the door plugs used on the upper doors of the Caltrains. Speaking of those trains, make sure you're subscribed because I'm going to do a deep dive on them in an entirely separate video coming soon. Despite what you might think with Stadler's consistent and standardized product lines, the trains also just really aren't ever off the shelf, so there's always customization needed, even down to things like the thickness of the insulation in the walls, which then slightly changes the way every other component needs to be mounted. There's a lot of additional electrical work with a train like the electric Caltrain Kisses because, well, they are powered by overhead wires, and for a flirt, like those being built right now and being used in Ottawa, the central power car needs to be put together. This happens with a combination of up to four diesel engines and generators, and a lot of cables and zip ties. As I talked about in my Ottawa video, the nice thing about the Flirt is that the train's basic architecture is electric, so as opposed to some other diesel trains, the Flirts are smooth and quiet. At the same time, the finished components are added to the inside of the cars, including cantilevers for seats, passenger information displays, flooring, lighting, the operator's cabin controls, and the various electrical panels. While all of this work is happening on the train bodies, there's also parallel work going on on the trucks and bogies. They actually also assembled the trucks right here in the factory, which is pretty cool to see, especially because despite how important this component is to a train, you often won't be able to see it broken up into its constituent components, and not on the train. The process starts with the frames and axles, which are different from train to train. For example, you can really see the difference between the size of Caltrain and Dart wheels. Next, the trucks are fully built out and specialized, adding various suspension, sanding, and lubrication components. Of course, some trucks have motors while others do not. At the same time, the trucks used on Dart are Jacob's bogies, shared between two cars, while those used on Caltrain are not. The pivot used for those Jacob's bogies is actually fabbed in-house, which is pretty cool. Another very interesting thing is that some of the components in the process are actually fused together using liquid nitrogen. Basically, you have one bit that fits in another, but would be too large to easily slide in, at room temperature. So they supercool it and shrink it with liquid nitrogen, then they can pop it in, and when it expands, the pressure basically fuses the components together, which is really cool. There's also a lot of interesting test equipment, including scales and hydraulic cylinders that can simulate loading on the suspension, to ensure everything is aligned properly and there aren't any problems. At this point, the bogies are moved over to a track out in the main hall, and the train bodies are lifted via overhead cranes onto them. This is especially tricky with the flirts, because since they have Jacob's bogies, everything sort of needs to be done at once, whereas with the Caltrain cars, they can sort of go car by car. All of this creates a bit of a game of Tetris to fit the various trains around the facility, especially if there are any delays in the process. Heading over to the commissioning tracks, we get to see an almost complete train, with the electrical equipment being tested. You might notice that there are no seat cushions on this Caltrain car. Touches like that go in at the very end because you don't want someone with some wire cutters or something accidentally tearing a cushion open or scratching something. I should say that this part of the building is really big, enough to hold a 7-car bi-level Caltrain with room to spare, and it's designed much like the rest of the building to be expanded in the future if orders call for it. You might wonder where all of the parts used to assemble the trains come from. It's really from all over the place, and many parts are actually sourced locally within the US, but there are quite obviously some Swiss parts as well. The size of the warehouse where the various components are stored is pretty incredible. It felt like nearly half of the site, and had racks piled high with everything it takes to assemble a train, from screws all the way up to flooring and pantographs. At the end of the tour, we got to see a proper finished train, a flirt that will be sent out to Dallas to run on the Silver Line, which despite being similar to TexRail, another rail service to Dallas-Fort Worth Airport that also uses very similar flirts, is separate and will run on a new orbital line in North Dallas, connecting to various light rail services. I've talked before about how we can get more transit built, and trains like these are a great option. An infrastructure light regional rail service that's fast, has really nice trains, and regular consistent headways that can be incrementally upgraded as demand requires. Now, going on to the Dallas Flirt, it reminds us of Ottawa, but also with some significant differences, highlighting the custom nature of the trains. For example, Dallas's trains feature overhead luggage racks as well as tables and also have large mirrors and additional cameras to give operators a really good sense of what's around them. 
I think some combination of these two trains would be the perfect solution for most regional or commuter rail systems in North America, like GO, New Jersey Transit, or perhaps even the Sounder in Seattle. I also got to sit in the driver's seat, which was a lot of fun of course. There is quite the expansive view from the cap. What's probably most amazing about this is to see the transition from primed but otherwise untouched car to fully functioning train. Now, you might be wondering about testing. They actually have a 1km linear test track at the facility. So that's used for low speed dynamic testing, and because they have to test Caltrain electrical multiple units, they actually electrified the test track, meaning this may be, actually probably is, the only 25 kV AC overhead line electrified railway in Utah, which is kind of interesting. Walking around, we couldn't really have asked for better weather, and it was a truly beautiful sight, with the mountains off in the distance and modern European designed trains being tested and built right here in North America. Now, at the moment the shells themselves are manufactured at Statler's overseas facilities and shipped to the US. The trains are built using an aluminum honeycomb design that isn't common in North America right now as opposed to stainless steel bodies, but likely will become much more so. Not only because aluminum is corrosion resistant, but also because it's just so much lighter. This allows for more efficient fuel cults, and supposedly Statler's diesel powered flirts can get peak fuel economy similar to an SUV from just 10 years ago while moving 35 times as many people. You can start to see the transition to more modern manufacturing techniques happening as a system like Marta, who originally planned to purchase new stainless steel cars, was convinced to go with aluminum bodies instead, on what will likely be some of the nicest subway cars in America, and one of the first to have wide, fully open gangways. What's also interesting is that while car bodies are currently built overseas, the Stadler folks seemed optimistic about doing the work here in the future with another factory expansion. Doing so won't be simple because aluminum welding techniques needed to build the bodies aren't commonly used here right now, but the company seemed interested in partnering with local education institutions to teach these skills, and build a workforce that can do everything locally. Part of this is happening via a Swiss inspired apprenticeship program where students are actually brought in from local high schools to learn about the manufacturing process, and career opportunities as well as different trades needed in the space helping to develop passion and skills and knowledge about the rail industry. This is actually a rather unique program that's different from the traditional four year degree program and then maybe job in a potentially unrelated industry that is the typical career path in North America. And those working in the apprenticeship program seem to be really happy and quite passionate about their work. There's a really deep level of integration with the local community college and engineering department that allows students earning an associate's degree to get it paid for by Stadler while working part time at the company, and then even bring in professors to teach topics on site and talk about industry trends and techniques that would be useful for the students. Suffice to say, this as well as the efforts to get more underrepresented groups like women into the manufacturing space is a breath of fresh air creating a transit and rail industry that is democratized, but also bringing in new, passionate people from diverse backgrounds. All of this can hopefully go a long way to changing the perception of the trades and manufacturing industry. And you can see how. The facility itself is just really nice, and not really what you might expect a train factory looks like. For one, the main hall is big, open, and bright, lots of skylights, quite good for making YouTube videos, I need to add. And the ceiling is naturally super high, playing host to the cranes which are used to move the trains along the production line on the array of tracks as they are fit out. The space is also super neat. Sure, there are hoses and tools here and there, but it's not dusty. There aren't broken components or packaging lying around, and definitely no spilled oil or anything like that. Perhaps even more notable, the factory is quiet. The folks at Stadler mentioned the noise might be a problem when filming, but it was not. The factory was shockingly quiet for basically the whole day. Not a ton of loud drilling, hammering, and the like that you might expect with such a facility. The loudest thing was often some music playing as someone laid down cables or screwed together components. Basically, it seemed like a nice place to work. Speaking of the future, what does it hold? Well, what's really cool is that since Stadler has this factory, they're probably going to be bidding on more train orders in North America. And given the company's well-known reputation for reliability and slick designs, that's a great thing, since better transit user experiences make more people want to ride transit. In fact, it was even mentioned that they're interested in bringing the new Tina tram platform here, which would be a big upgrade on US light rail systems with its 100% low floor design. And even for Canadian systems, thanks to the wide aisle and totally flat floor enabled by the tram's unique bogies. 
Trains like these would make a ton of sense for a city like Salt Lake, and of course I'd really like to see them on various light rail lines being built in Canada, particularly in Toronto. All in all, it excites me that the North American train market is getting another big player that will drive more competition in an era when we need to get more transit built. I can also only hope that as regulations around train design continue to be modernized, the trains we build right here could become more and more like their European counterparts. Again, a big shout out to Stadler for having me out here at their factory. It was really cool to just be able to see the work that's being done and also just the transition of the North American transit space towards something that's more internationalized. So thanks for watching as always, and I'll see you in the next one.